TV from other dimensions has a somewhat looser feel to it. Yeah, it's got an almost improvisational tone. Hey everybody, how are we doing today? We are back, we are live, and we are getting ready for test one. Now I wanna mention something so big right here. We'll be ending class probably at like 4.48, 4.50, just a tiny bit earlier than we do, because what's happening at five? I know that's one of my favorite intros right there. That's a classic one we have. What is happening at five? That is, that is, that is Jason's work right there. And Jason will be coming in here at the end right here. He'll probably help out. We got some big things planned. Kahoot! And Kahoot is happening, and you can win either a $10 Starbucks gift card, a $5 Starbucks gift card, a $3 Starbucks gift card. And I've got huge news that uh, we have one of the top Kahoot players is coming back. Uh, they are a student from a New York university, I believe, and they saw our Kahoot live last year. And so this is a public video today because this is a review video, so I'm making this one public. But they saw our, our review last year and they joined in and they were like in the top 10. And they saw us live yesterday on the channel and they said, first Kahoot's coming up, I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna be competing. If we cannot stay for the Kahoot, can you watch it afterwards? Um, you can't, so you can't win, but you can watch it afterwards. So, <laughs> So be ready to play the Kahoot. Be ready for some Kahoot fun. And hopefully no one tries to crash us. Um, but um, yes, we'll have some fun. We'll play Kahoot. And it'll be awesome as per usual. Uh, today, uh, one big thing I want to point out. Let's talk a little bit. We'll hop. You know what works actually now? We're going to try something out. Let's see if it does what it should do. Because I, I worked on something yesterday. We're going to hit a button right here and see what this button does. Will it work? Oh, we just didn't get the Word document up. It almost worked. <laughs> Pretty close. Just need to get it so it brings up the Word document. So the speed run, Windows is failing. <laughs> like, da 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 da. <laughs> so we got a lot of questions right now. Let's do a speed run of some questions right here. We need to pull up the timer. Still got to, I'm trying to get it so it keeps saying, do you want to go to the store for the timer? I tried to turn off the asking for the store thing. So we'll pull up the timer right here and we'll take a look at the speed run. And we've got a few questions. We're gonna speed run some questions right here. So we're gonna start off today's class with a speed run of every question you have about the exam. The speed run, question, the speed run button is working again till this live split timer actually will load when I tell it to load and not load two. I click it twice so it loads two of course. <laughs> So um, let's get the speed run timer on the screen and let's, oh no, didn't want to do that. I changed the dimensions of it. There we go. Let's get this back on the screen right here and let's do a speed run of questions people have related to the test. So we're going to do test related questions here to start this out. Um, how long will the Kahoot take? We're going to take all questions right here and we're going to answer all questions out loud. So here we go, starting the speed run of all questions leading up to the exam. How long will the Kahoot take? The Kahoot usually lasts about 60 through 90 minutes. The Kahoot is 60 through 90 minutes. Uh, we got the speed run best section back. How many quizzes per test get dropped? This is a little bit tricky of a one because on the first test, you have two drops. On the second test, you have one drop. On the third test, you have one drop drop. So this one is kind of where you get the most forgiving amount of drops. Uh, what calculator can we use on the exam? What calculator can be used for the exam? The answer is any calculator as long as it does not have internet capabilities. So let's put any with an asterisk and put right here no internet. You can't have a calculator that has internet capabilities, so we'll put no internet capabilities. Can you do one on calculating the regression line from two means? And oh, Rachel, great question. Nothing like that will be on the exam. The exam focuses more on interpretations of slope, interpretations of intercept, interpretation of R squareds, solving the regression equation. So when you have something like the regression equation here, y hat equals b0 plus b1x1, this right here is a regression equation. And then we should know that we could do things like predicting height from it. So this would be predicted height is equal to 40 plus 0 0.15 inches. And I'm just making this up. 
but we should know how to solve this equation. We should know what residuals are and all those good things right here. Um, there we go, about halfway done. We'll keep going, we can go to bonus two. Are there study guides and practice problems? If so, where can I find them? Neely, amazing question. The study guides and the practice stuff is located on the Stat Tool One webpage. So the Stat Tool One webpage is the, I'm gonna type in the chat, I think. Uh, don't go there now, because I think it'll leave our video. That should bring it right there, stat21.utk.edu. Um, stat21.utk.edu. How many, so that answers Neely's questions. Where is the exam? It's gonna be an alumni memorial building. The exam is in alumni memorial building. The exam is in alumni memorial building, and I'm 99% sure of the time. Double, double check the syllabus. I'm always afraid to say it in a video, lest I'm wrong. Um, but it'll be Monday in Alumni Memorial. Remember, email me if you have a conflict. We talked about that at the start. Even you get 10 on 10 on all quizzes. Yeah, we, we drop, the, we drop. so if you get 10 on 10s, that's awesome. Um, what characteristics are affected by multiplication? I think Grayson, let's talk about that just briefly here. Grayson's wondering, when you multiply stuff, let's take numbers like one, two, three, and four. Now, the mean of these numbers would be uh, 2.5 and also the median would be 2.5. So the mean and the median of these numbers would be 2.5. So this is both the mean and the median. So if we were to multiply this right here by 10, then we would see a drastic change. We'd get 10, 20, and 30. And actually, you know, when we multiply numbers, we've changed the range. There's the range of the numbers. We've changed the mean and the median of the numbers to 25. We've also changed the spread of these numbers. So multiplying looks to change the center and the spread of numbers. So great question right there, Grayson, 1,000 points. Um, will you have office hours tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm gonna come to the office at 11. Uh, might do a little broadcasting online too. Uh, tomorrow I'll be in the office at 11 a.m. I'm doing a little extra office hours and there'll be lots of office hours on Monday and we probably will do some broadcasting too on Monday. So tomorrow at 11 a.m. I will be in the office for a little extra office hours. Uh, I, th I see, what is chapter eight homework and quiz? It's basically a little extra regression. Chapter eight homework and quiz is a little extra regression. Chapter eight homework and quiz is a little extra regression. Um, double check the syllabus for time of the test. I'm just always afraid to say it lest I'm wrong. I have a time I think it is and it starts with a six and ends with a 30. It says we change every semester and I know sometimes I'll think the wrong one and I'll say it and the last thing I wanna do, I'll send out reminders and everything. Check the syllabus, it's in there, it's right in the syllabus. Um, will some of the questions on the exam require long sentences or just multiple choices? Some of them will be long fill in the blanks. Um, some of them will be longer fill in the blanks. Are you going to have us hours tomorrow and 11 a.m. tomorrow if you wanna to come see me 11 a.m. If you add to the numbers instead of multiply, what characteristics does that change? Simon, great question. So if you add to the numbers, let's do this right here, one comma two comma three comma four. If we add to the numbers, like let's say we add 10, we get 11 comma 12 comma 13 comma 14. Now this drastically changed the what of the distributions. Look where space pen is at, everyone loves space pen. Um, what has changed about these distributions right here? Uh, the what? The center. So where the center was 2.5, either the mean or the median, it's, it's a uniform distribution, it's rather flat. But what has not changed, the range has not changed. By adding a constant, we have not changed the range, it still has the same IQR. So the IQRs are still the same for these, the range is still the same, and the uh, standard deviations. Michin right there, uh, Machen, so um, I think I have it right, is correct. The spread is not affected by it. So the spread is not affected, which is measured by the standard deviation and the IQR and the range. Now remember, we do have some stuff that goes together. You should always remember which things. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you for all the questions. Um, this is our speed run of questions. We're in the bonus time right now. This is our speed run of questions that you have related to the test or what's going on in the world today. That's statistics related. And so will there be similar numbers for questions for every chapter? Is it focused on... Um, it's about evenly spread anywhere from about 8% to 20%. Like some chapters have less, some chapters have more, but it's, it's even-ish. I mean, it's not like everything's perfectly even, but fairish. It's a little uniform distribution. Can you go over determining whether the standard deviation is large or small for graphs? Would uniform have a small or larger standard deviation? So if you had two distributions here with a similar range, eh, space pen might not be the perfect pen for that. So let's go here and go and do a distribution. And we're going to go right here and do a uniform. Uh, the uniform is more spread out. So the uniform is probably going to have a bigger standard deviation. Because think about this. 
to turn it into the uniform into the normal curve, you'd have to clump it together towards the middle. So you'd have to push it in towards the center. Um, to turn the normal curve, you'd have to like flatten it out. You'd have to press it down, which means to spread it out more, to create more variation in the data. So that has kind of a more spread out variation. So is the test easier than the quizzes? Um, maybe, that's a really hard question. Um, I do, and here's one big thing I would say. Uh, please take note of this. Many people, if I can't, I, I wish I could pause the timer here. And I'm going to pause the timer because I want to, this is serious talk here. The biggest thing I can say to you is this. I heard from a lot of students that they said, I didn't watch live and I didn't do well on the first test. And then I started to watch live and started to take notes and I started to do well. I heard it was easily a half dozen students. Now that is a half dozen, that is convenience bias. So I'm getting a convenience response here. The people who are coming to me are voluntary bias, which is kind of convenient if I just talk to the students who come to my office hours. But a lot of them were saying, really going to class live and taking the notes live and then rewatching the videos and using your notes while you rewatch the videos, they started to make like B's and A's on the exams. So if, if you are watching this now and maybe you don't do as well on test one, Give this a shot for test two, because here's what's going to happen. Attendance, I watched the analytics on this, has been going like this on the YouTube channel. Oh, no, no, no. It's been going down a little bit as we go through class. I've seen this slow decrease that maybe each class we lose five more students. We lose another five. We go from 210 to 205 to 200 to 195 to 190. Hey, good to see you, Margaret, right there. So um, we slowly have been dropping down a little bit, just a little bit, a little bit. So what I hope to see is when we come back here Tuesday after the test, one, here's some really awesome news, 132, oh no, oh no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> we go 190, 185, 132. Um, this is where, uh, oh no, we need, to, we need to up it. We need to be watching live because I'll tell you this much right now, uh, and then we'll do, we got more questions in the chat. Um, when we come back after the test, we're going to do the randomness chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters. We play The Price is Right, and I will uh, a lot, <laughs> a lot more than we have watching live. So 340, I believe. And so, but it's an online class, and we're actually doing really well for an online class, but we're always going to do better. And I promise you, the people who told me, I used to just try to watch the videos, I'd try to watch them on the weekend, and when I made a habit of watching it live, I would do better. They're like, it was easier. I understood the material. I took down the notes. I could ask you questions live. So if you are able, uh, we've had 200. We've had 200 because uh, we used to we used to break 200. We did it a few times. And then uh, we've had it in the first class. I think we had like 240 or 250. So watching live, I think, is key. So, and I understand, don't worry. If you're watching this now and it's a recording and you have work, if you have family, I totally understand. Uh, so I see a lot of questions. We're going to hop back and hear the questions. Guess what? It's going back to speed running these questions here. Um, how do you interpret the y-intercept? This is in a lot of the videos, so I'm just going to say it. It's for uh, the y-intercept is when x is equal to 0, we expect y to equal b0. When um, x is equal to 0, we expect y to equal b0. What is the definition of r? r is correlation. r is equal to correlation, but r is not r squared. But you know what? Um, w when we talk about r squared, if how can you get r from r squared? Even though r squared is not r, we've said that a lot of times, r squared is the percent of variation in y explained by the variation in x, how do you get r from r squared? Square root it. Now that is r. So r is not r squared. They're not the same thing. One is correlation. So this one right here is correlation. So this here is correlation. We'll write core below it. And this one here is percent of variation explained. Um, but be careful. This is the one people forget because it's the percent of variation explained. Blank percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation uh, in X. Blank percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X is the interpretation of R squared. And R squared is not equal to R. It's not the same thing. So if you do square root it, you do get R, but R squared is not R. It's not R, and I have a really great example to show this. I want to ask you this right now. I'm gonna show you two R squareds, and I'm gonna go a little bit beyond the class, not too far beyond. So with this right here, blank percent of the variation Y is explained by the variation X, amazing Julio right there, thousand points. So I want you to look at this graph I have where I draw some space points. We love those space points. 
My space points is now are now making a what? My space points are now making a what? The space points have made a what form? The space points have made a what form? What form have the space points made? A curve, a parabola. So they made a parabolic form. So what we'd have right here is we could put a line through it. Now, it's a nonlinear form. Now, I want to make sure you know that this is some sort of strong uh, relationship, some sort of strong association. So I'm going to put a little subscript below this R, and let's do an R squared, because that's what I want to talk about for now. This R squared right here is going to be the R squared of the line. Don't worry, we're not going to do subscripts on the test, but I'm trying to illustrate a concept right here. So the R squared of the line is equal to what? Can anyone tell me what percent of the variation in the Y variable, whatever it is, we'll just call this this, and we'll call this this, what percent of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X due to the line? And that's what we use in this class is we use a line. Correlation is zero, so R squared is zero. You're exactly right, so R squared. And now when you interpret this, you would say 0% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. Think about that. But guess what I could do? In upper level statistics, we could fit this. And now we get an R squared of the parabola. And maybe that has an R squared of 90%. Now, this is not on the test, so do not write 90% of the variation in Y is explained by the parabolic relationship X has with Y. But that is true. Think about how well that green parabolic form does at explaining the points. The line does nothing. It, it's just a flat line, which doesn't explain the parabolic relationship. But if you were to fit a parabolic relationship, you would get an R squared of 90%, which would say 90% of the variation in Y is explained by the parabolic relationship that X has with Y. And there are ways of doing this, but once again, for our class, we will not be doing nonlinear forms. So pretend I never showed you that. So like that never happened. But this is why R squared is not R. R squared is not correlation. So um, how do we p-value? Great question. This with a p-value, when you think about p-values right here, this one would have a p-value that would be very, 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 very close to what? And then we'll do another topic here with this. This one would have a p-value that is super close to what? And they might have, I think, Nicole might have typed it in the chat right here, and so is Anne. 1,000 points for these questions and for these answers. We see right here that the p-value on this, so we're going to write p-value on it, is equal to about zero. But what if, let's do counterexamples here. What if we had some sort of space points right here where it had something like this right here? Now with this one, we're going to get an R squared. Can anyone guess what the R squared is here? And can we interpret the R squared? Give me a guess of the R squared here, 1,000 points. All these questions today are worth 1,000 points. What is the R squared here? So R squared is 0 for... Uh, if the line is flat, R squared is 0. If the line is flat, R squared is 0. And I see some great answers for R squared. We're going to go ahead and pick SNE right there for 70%. And we're going to give you 5,000 points first to answer. Amazing job. That's We're just kind of guessing... Uh, it's, it's decently strong. Uh, I would say that's moderately strong. It is linear. And once again, maybe there's a point here or a point here. These would not be outliers. We try to make outliers fairly obvious. Um, this is pretty linear. It 70% seems about good. It might be 60% somewhere in that neighborhood. We're just kind of guessing. Um, the tighter it is, the stronger it is, and thus the correlation would be higher. How do we turn correlation into R squared? What would 50%? Oh, here, I'll do some drawings for you. Let me see. I've got room on the bottom. Uh, if you go across, these are just guesstimates right here. Uh, we'll do a pattern right here, and we'll change it. So that's 0. That's maybe, uh, that's maybe 10. I'll put the numbers above it. So maybe 30. Sorry, it's so small. That's like 60. That's 80. And if you notice, all I'm trying to illustrate right here, I missed the point, sorry. Um, if you notice what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show it become tighter. As you go from a gradient, I'll move this for a moment. If you were to take this and go from a gradient from like R squared going from 0 to 100%, uh, now technically 100%, if I'm going to draw 100%, I need to draw a specific thing. 100% R squared is only achieved There, 100% R squared is only achieved when everything is perfectly on a linear relationship. 
So the gradient of how R squared looks is the more it looks like a blob, the more it, the closer it is to zero, the more it gets tighter of an ellipse, the closer it is. Now, don't worry, you're never going to have to get it exact, but it's very related to correlation. But R squared is not correlation. Um, but the way it works is the tighter it is, the stronger it is, the stronger the correlation, the higher the R squared. Now, does it matter if the line goes up or down for R squared? Does that matter at all if the line goes up or down for R squared? Because think how we'll get R squared, we'll square correlation. So it doesn't matter if the line is up or down. Um, so what it is, the p-value, great question. The way the p-value would relate, and we'll put p-value below this, p-value right here is going to be closer to 1. And so this is, let me write, I got enough room, good. This right here is R squared. And this right here is p-value. So the p-value for the weakest correlations, so that's the p-value, and then the p-value will get closer to 0. So the weaker correlations have, co have p-values closer to 1 because they're more likely to happen if there's no correlation. So when you see a weak correlation, you're like, yeah, that's kind of what I expect if there's no correlation. And we probably will do a review of this in a moment here. But the weaker correlations, which are over here on this side, the weaker correlations have higher p-values. The stronger correlations, or r-squareds, because you can get r-squared from correlation. Remember, r-squared is literally correlation squared, so that's r-squared. So the weaker correlations have p-values closer to 1, and the stronger correlations have p-values closer to 0. So the stronger the correlation, the more significant it is. And significant means lower p-value. Um, does that make sense? As the r and r-squared get higher, everything staying the same, p-values get lower because it's stronger, it's more significant, i.e. less likely to happen by random chance. Um, great, Zach. I think we're going to do that right here, Zach. We're going to hop into talking about p-values and talking about um, the three times we used p-values for this test. Let's talk, as I erase everything, the three times. Can anyone tell me one of the times we used p-value? Can anyone be like, we used a p-value to test this? Can you remember when? Oh, thank you, Zach. All the questions today. That does that speed run. It's, it's speed run all day long. Um, the, the line, uh, so Simon, the last one, if we did the p-value of the line, the p-value of the line would be close to 1. And don't worry too much about the parabola. That was to illustrate the concept that, uh, and it's a great question, 1,000 points, uh, but the p-value on the, or the, excuse me, the r-squared on the parabola is to show us that we can do things that explain other than lines, like we can have a par parabola that explains y from x. So r squared is not, it's not literally r, but we can use r to get it, and all that great stuff right there. Zach, you get a 1,000, of course you do. Um, P-value, yes, that is one time right there. Rachel, you are correct. That is one of the ways. So let's do another speed run right here. I probably, I should cut, I should do individual topics and cut these into videos. Let's talk about the three times we've used p-values for test one. So what we have right here is we need to think about the three times we've used it. The first time we did it was to test to see if something is normal. So when we tested to see if something is normal, we would start out by believing it is normal. Now, I want you to think in your head, if something is normal, what do you expect it to look like? Just think, if it is normal, and you'll get this when we do it for the next ones, we expect it to look what? If it is normal, I would expect it to look normal. So if it is normal, we would expect it to look normal. Now the next thing we did is we did when there's correlation. Now what we assume for this one is that there's no correlation. So when we assume there's no correlation, what do you expect to see if there's no correlation? What would you expect to see, so remember our trick for the last one, if there's no correlation, what would you expect to see if there's no correlation? Correlation requires a scatter plot, so what would you expect to see if there's no correlation? Remember, well, be careful. First time, if it's normal, we expect to see a normal curve. If there's no correlation, I would expect to see scattered dots. I see it in the chat, and also scattered dots mean there's no correlation. This means that the correlation is probably pretty close to zero. That's what I expect to see. Now, what would we expect to see if there's no slope? If there's no slope, what would I expect to see? This is the null we're starting out with, the null being that there's no slope. This is what I'm starting out believing. If there's no slope, 
what do I expect to see when I draw it? A straight line. Perfect answer right there. I expect to see a straight line. So let's add some dots in. Just like the last one, there's going to be nothing going on right here. So now we're going to add in a flat line, which has no slope. And that's what I expect to see if there's no slope. That's the likely thing to see. So what would we not expect to see? If there was a normal curve for our data, what would we not expect to see? If the normal curve is what our data is, and then we do our data, what would we not expect to see? I expect it, go back to the top, I expect it to look normal, what would I not expect it to look like? I expect it to look normal, what would I not expect it to look like? Any ideas? Think for a moment, think, if it's normal, it should look normal. Skewed, not normal. So this drawing right here is something we would not expect. So this right here, there's many drawings we could do. We could put an extreme outlier and even more extreme outlier off there. It was actually off the screen. So we have right here what's something we would not expect. This is a non-normal curve. Now anything not normal is not normal. So this is what we would not expect on the far side of the screen up there. If there's no correlation, what would you not expect to see? And this doesn't mean bad. It just means if there's no correlation, I expect to see no correlation. If there, what would I not expect to see? If there's no correlation, I would not expect to see a what? If there's no correlation, I would not expect to see what? I would not expect to see correlation. You are right. I would not expect to see correlation. Look at that right there. We've got a really strong correlation right there. You can kind of tell the correlation by doing your density ellipse. And it looks like a 1, which means it's closer to 1. The first one to the left of it looks like a 0, so it's weaker. So this is a stronger, tighter correlation that looks unlikely. We'll be talking about that in a moment. By random chance. Now just do the same right here. If there's no slope to the line, what would you not expect to see? The first one was what we expected, and there's no slope. But for the next one, we're going to say, well, if there's no slope, well, I wouldn't expect there to be a what? If there's no slope to the line, I would not expect there to be a what? If there is no slope to the line, we'll have to re-space pen over it. Space pen is taken over. If there's no slope, I would not expect to see what? I would not expect to see a slope. Exactly. And look at that slope over there. It's like, huh, that doesn't look likely. I thought there was no slope. So what do you do on the far right? You reject your null each time. And all of these ones over here are the nulls for the test. We didn't write them in statistical notation. We kind of wrote them so someone could just generally understand them. So what goes with these graphics? Well, all of these right here, and let's make it very clear, these right here are all going to have low p-values. I'm going to start with the other ones. Low p-values. So low p values. And these all have high, too high, high p values. And think about what a high p value is. We're saying if the null is true, it's likely that we'd see a normal curve like this. If the null is true, it's likely that we'd see no correlation like this. If the null is true, it's likely that we'd see no slope because the null says there's no slope, so that's likely to see. Kahoot is at five, come in and check it out, stay around. And we got a really awesome video at the end of class. It'll be, I mean, not a video, something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen at the end of class. Check it out, stay to the end, lots of fun, something crazy might happen, who knows. So let's go here to low p-value. This was what, if it's normal, then this is unlikely. Right here, if it's, no, if it's no correlation, then correlation is unlikely. If there's no slope, then seeing a strong slope is unlikely. And we did lots of review in this class. This is kind of a quick speed run review of these concepts of how we handle the null and alternative at the start, just to kind of understand what's going on here with what we assume and what is likely or unlikely. And once again, I want to reiterate, I shouldn't have stopped that speed run, uh, speed run timer. I'm cheating right here that when we talk about a low p-value, what do we mean by a low p-value? It's very important we know that all low p-values are p-values less than 0.05. A low p-value is a p-value less than 0.05. So that is very important right here to understand what is going on. Oh no, no buffering on the, on the laptop. So fail to reject the null on the left 
and reject on the right, correct. Um, and the left ones would have higher p-values, telling you that that is likely. Simon, excellent work. You would say, I fail to reject the null because that looks normal. So think, if you fail to reject the null, you would continue to believe that this is normal. If you fail to reject the null, you would continue to believe that there's no correlation. If you fail to reject the null, you would continue to believe there's no slope. And then we go over here to this right here. If you reject the null, you're saying I have evidence that it's not normal. If you reject the null here, you're saying I have evidence there's correlation. If you reject the null, you're saying I have evidence there is a slope. You're here to learn stats. That's what we do here. So with all of this in mind right now, uh, we're the, I think I saw some other questions. When drawing a box in Whisker, uh, we will not draw box in Whisker plots on the test. Let me erase the screen right here. There was a massive way to erase, I think. So don't worry, you're welcome. You guys are awesome. I love all the questions. Um, I am so happy with what we can do with this online way of teaching. Uh, this tablet I have is absolutely awesome. It's a H-U-I-O-N tablet. And when I was looking at tablets, I read every review and this actually makes my handwriting almost look, to look acceptable, which I am very pleased with. And we're just going to keep taking questions. We're going to keep reviewing for the test before the Kahoot. Um, do we have to draw any graphs on the test? Not really. I don't think there's any drawings. Uh, the, so the upper and the lower fences. So what would a question about the p-value ask on the test? Uh, we could ask you, it's important to know when we do a test for normality, um, it's important to know, let's look at that. Let's go to jump. We're going to hop over here to jump. We're going to jump into jump. And so let's squish, switch to full screen right here. You're going to see behind the curtain. Oh my gosh, this is how he does speed runs. <laughs> it's like the box where I should be able to see where I cannot graph outside of, but we need to adjust that. More adjustments are coming. So um, uh, the exam is like 50% fill in the blanks and 25% multiple choice and 25% true falses, uh, true falses. Um, so generally like a you know, usual exam. Go right here, let's go to, let's go to the haircut data. Haircut data. So where's haircut data? Right here, CSV files. Let's do the haircut data. Okay, so we want to do a test right here to see if it's normal. To see if the test is normal, uh, he, he's gonna come at the end, then we'll get Jason Cam. So Kahoot time, 5 p.m. Yeah, so we got this right here. I want you to look at this real quick and tell me if this looks normal. Tell me right here, does this look normal, yes or no? Does this look normal right here? I promise, I promise there will be Jason today. I promise everything there'll be Jason today. So right here, this does not look normal. This does, n thousand points, all those no's in the chat. I love seeing the chat go crazy like this. Now, what we can do, remember, is we can do what's called a normal probability plot. So we can go right here and we can go to, uh, we go to normal quantile plot. Forgot it's called that in here. We call this, at least in our class, a normal probability plot. And if you notice the red line, I'm gonna make this really big so we can see what's going on. But the red line here is what a normal curve looks like. We deviate from that. We have a very strong right skew to this data. You'll notice that these points are kind of bending out. You've kind of got this bend to the data. If it was perfectly normal, it would follow this. Now this is not testing for like linearity or making a linear model or doing regression or doing correlation. All this does. All a normal probability plot does is tell you, read it backwards, the probability that this plot is normal. Is this plot normal? What is the probability this plot is normal? A normal probability plot. And how do you know if it's normal? Well, normal plots will generally follow this red line. What this red line is trying to do, let's add a little extra info here and kind of talk about the next thing. This red line is actually that normal curve right here. And if you notice, look at where the biggest uh, deviation, I can't speak today, Look at where the biggest deviation is. It's over here. And look, it's far away from the red line. So this red line right here is showing you that it's not going underneath. That's why these points right here are so far away. If I highlight these points, it's those points right there are not underneath the curve where they should be. They're not following this red line. So you'll see that the deviations are worse down here. You see where this peaks outside of it? Guess where these points are? They're inside of there. There's too many of those. So how would it look if it was really great normal? If it was really awesome normal, where would all these black points be? Where would all the black points be if it was really awesome normal? If it was really awesome normal, they'd be right on top of that middle red line. Perfect answer right there. So they'd be right on top of that red line, but they're not. 
they escape. Here we have too many, and you can see this because there's too many. Now it's graphing the lower ones. I guess we could just click this bar and you can see, yes, there's too many inside of here. Here, there's not enough because we should have more down here. It does escape, but it's because of this that we see that we're down here. So we see that this does not perfectly follow the normal. So we have one more way of looking at this right here. We're gonna make these smaller. We have what is called a goodness of fit test. Always try to read and make sense of what it is. Like when you think about why is it called a goodness of fit test, the goodness of fit test, which is right here, is going to see if that normal curve is a good fit. And this is what we did just a moment ago. It literally tells us the null is that the data is from the normal. I've enlarged it so you can see it right here next to me. It says the data is from the normal. That's the null hypothesis. And we usually leave this on the test. So think, the null is that the data is from the normal. Small p-values, i.e. less than 0.05, reject the null. So in this instance, we're gonna reject the null and say we have evidence it is not normal. So because of that low p-value right there, I have evidence that that curve on the far side is not normal. I reject the null that it's normal. Remember it says, says the null is the data from the normal and the p-value, I'm pointing to it right there, that one right next to my finger is the p-value because p-values are probabilities. Uh, not the chi-squared thing yet. Does this make more sense? Does everyone kind of better understand what's going on right here for this question? Does everyone have a good idea or like understand how to figure out if we have uh, normality from this and also what's going on? Yes, makes sense, like hearing that. Now we have two more instances when we use p-values. The two other instances when we use p-values are also when we have right here, let's go to multivariate method, multivariate. I'm gonna correlate these things right here and we're gonna look at a correlation matrix. Now with a correlation matrix, we can see the correlation between tip and time, tip amount and age, time and age, and then it just kind of flows through again. Now using our knowledge from before, exactly, I reject the normal curve, I reject the null that it is normal, I have evidence that the curve is not normal, yes, Julio, a thousand points right there, perfect answer, that's exactly how we'll be saying it later on in the class when I say I reject the null, I have evidence to the alternative, perfect answer, thousand points, well earned. Um, so now, um, let's take a look at this right here, which of these correlations are the strongest and which is the weakest? Which correlation between what and what here is the strongest? Now there, none of them are really strong, but which of them is the strongest? Which of these correlations is the strongest between blank and blank? It's pretty interesting that this actually turned out this way. Between blank and blank is the strongest correlation. Tip amount and age. And how you read it, great answer, 1,000 points right there, Simon, amazing answers. Tip amount is right here, and then age is right here. So we have to connect in on it. We have to be like, okay, that is the strongest correlation. Now, all of these ones are just novel because tip amount explains tip amount. It's like a tip amount is correlated with tip amount because what you tip is what you tip. So don't worry about that. 1,000 points, all those answers in the chat. And so don't worry about these one correlations right here. They're purposeless. We don't, it's novel, it's nothing. So tell me, since this has the highest correlation and all these have the same amount of data points it's kind of similar uh, things going on here since it has the highest correlation you expect its p-value to be the whatest stronger correlation which i know it's not really strong but stronger than the other ones its p-value should theoretically be what to the other ones it has the strongest correlation it should have the lowest p-value let's take a look right here and let's do the pairwise correlations and we see that everyone was saying oh look Age and tip amount is actually statistically significant, and Jump likes to put the star on this, and that means we have evidence of a statistically significant correlation. And if you look at it, it is the strongest, and the weaker ones have weaker, weaker p-values. And what do I mean by a weaker p-value? A higher likelihood of random chance occurring. And so you can see here that this correlation right here looks like a blob. None of these look amazing. I know this one is apparently the best. It might be due to outliers. We got a little QQ straight enough. No outliers point. Uh, <laughs> I saw the point of five. QQ straight enough. No outliers. Plot doesn't thicken. Uh, and that's a final condition for regression. But uh, we have here that it's below 0.05. It is statistically significant. Thousand points, all those answers in the chat. Um, great job. Practice this. I will say this. When you get an answer wrong in the chat, you remember it. You'd be like, wait. That was the question. That was the one Brian was talking about. That is the only statistically significant correlation because it has below 0.05. When is something statistically significant? When the p-value for it is below 0.05. So this was the second time we talked about uh, p-values right here. Uh, it was for correlation. And we see here that the only statistically significant correlation is between age and tip amount. And don't look at the value of the correlation. 
I want to see this in the chat. Every time you hear statistical significant, you want what to be below 0.05. Every time you hear statistically significant, the only thing you should look at is what? To see if I'm reaching behind the graphic right now. I'm just going to reach behind it. So every time you're p-value, Carl's 1,000 points right there, Nic Nicolette and Sarah, yes. Um, we want to see the p-value is below 0.05 whenever we say statistically significant. That's what it means to be statistically significant is that our results or results more extreme happening by random chance variation, given that the null is true, is unlikely less than 0.05% of the time or less than 5% of the time. So um, every time you hear statistically significant, you want p-value to be below 0.05. Yes, that's what statistical significance means. Simon, another 1,000 points. Keep those answers up. You know what's going on. And so let's see right here. You know, it, I really, it makes me really happy to know that other people at other universities use this. That was really cool that they came in here and they're like, yeah, I watched this guy's videos. I'm like, that is so cool. Because, um, you know, like you guys know, I love the University of Tennessee. You guys are, I want you to be, you know, having an awesome time. And <laughs> I want you, I'm looking here. There we go. <laughs> and let's see right here. Let's take a look right here. Let's go ahead and fit this line. Oh my gosh, what do we got going on right here? Now look at this line. This line looks very what? It looks very flat. And if you're watching this lecture in full right here, you remember uh, <laughs> I went to ten. I went to here and I went to Appalachian State. I transferred from Appalachian State, so I went to UT and Appalachian State. Um, you need to make sure. Uh, <laughs> um, you need to remember that right here, how to read all of this output. You know what's really interesting? Did I leave it up? It went away. Uh, what we have right here is we have the p-value of the slope, which looks to be the same p-value we had for the correlation. Now, the p-value of the slope and the p-value of the intercept are two separate things. Remember, this right here, we talked about this a lot in yesterday's review video. Did anyone watch the review video I did yesterday? Um, I know it's like lecture or just like practice review. I did a lot of the questions. We also uh, went over the how to read this output. So I might not do that too much now. I think we've got some normal curve questions next. But this right here, I want you to know how to read this. You should know how to read this output right here. So very, 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 very important. So all of that great stuff right here. Amazing, amazing stuff. Let's see. So with this output, let's take a look at it. Right here we have, I'm going to make this look clear, we have here y hat. This is y hat. This is b0. And this is b1. And this is x. x is what you plug in and multiply through in your equation. x. So um, which one is the p-value there? The p-value is the p-value of the slope. The slope is the p-value one we are looking at. I'm going to remove a little bit of output. And I'm going to make this tinier so we don't have to see the graphic because we don't need it anymore. And so now the p-value is this one right here, the bottom one. Because I want you to think about this. When you look at x and y and they have a relationship, this is changing the x and y relationship. I'm changing the way x and y have a relationship right now by changing the slope. X and Y have a positive relationship. X and Y have no relationship. X and Y have a negative relationship. So the relationship of X and Y is controlled by the slope. The intercept is really just an arbitrary point, so we don't care if it's statistically significant or not. Changing the intercept would do this to the line. It would change where it hits. If you see where my elbow's at, that's kind of the Y-axis, a little reverse image thing going on here. But changing the intercept changes just where it hits the Y-intercept. That's not the X-Y relationship. This is when X and not Y have no relationship. This is when they have a slight relationship. This is when they have a stronger relationship. So the slope tells us uh, the statistical significance and also the relationship X and Y have. If you can't make it to the Kahoot tonight, we'll be uploading. Yes, it'll be live right after. Check out the Kahoot afterwards. It'll be live on YouTube. Uh, with the values of B0 and B1 be given to us on the exam. Um, important to know that down here you have B1 and B0. I did say it in the reverse order. This right here, what I am pointing at right here, this 5.788 was the same value that was right here for B0. And if you look the way it's written, it says estimate of intercept. It is the estimate of the intercept. This is the estimate of time, which is the coefficient of the x. This right here is B1. I am pointing at B1 right now. This right here is B0. That is B0 right there. Does that make sense? Uh, Correct. If you want to know if a regression line is statistically significant, look at the p-value of the slope. That is a really strong note to take right there. If you want to know if... <laughs> I might get a Coca-Cola after this. I think... Oh, they're asking something in the chat. 
<laughs> I think that's my plan between when I get uh, the Kahoot up and going. So if you want to know if a regression model is statistically significant, uh, get the p-value for the slope. If you want to know if a regression model is statistically significant, get the p-value for the slope. Really good stuff right there. Um, and, and Haley asked a really good question. You won't have to solve it like the Excel things. You will not have to solve it like the Excel things. I think there was a lot of questions about doing a question like the hockey times. That was a question people were saying, can you do a hockey time, que a hockey question? So let's bring up, I'm going to bring up the David M. Lane applet. And let me take a picture right here. And we're going to bring this picture in. And so let's do this. Okay, I'm going to make a picture right here to help out, and then I want you to see, here's a really good way. If you can solve this question, I should, let me do this. I'm going to do a different one than the one I did in class today. Two seconds. I'm getting you guys question ready. All right, good. Ooh, that's an interesting one right there. Okay. I carried out a lot of decimals. Makes it look harder on the test than it really is. Let's grab the picture of it. And let's do this. So this is a slightly difficult test question. We're going to go a little more difficult today than we usually do to make sure we're ready to go. New graph page right here. We're going to drop this in, and we're going to write a test question from it. Um, so with this, let's take a look. Let me bring back up the chat so I can see what's happening in the world today. And here we go. OK. Uh, with this right here, <laughs> let's take a look. This right here is a graphic showing us the normal curve where we have the area above a what. Now be careful. If you look at this, these everything on the curve right now is a what. The first thing you should identify about this when you see this graphic is that everything on this curve is a what. Everything on this curve is a what. Everything down here is a what right now. You should know that you should be, boom, everything right there is a what, Brian, because you see this and this. Every rank there is a z-score right there and a 1,000 points in Julio. Those are all z-scores. So we know we're seeing a, a normal curve with z-scores, and we see that we have the area above. So this is where this point is, a little space pen action. This is where this point is, and we're graphing the area above it. Great job following along right there. Practice ready for the test. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write a test question right here from this. So let's go in here and go before it and write out a fake test question. We'll say, Adam. Adam forgot to study for the stats, for his exam. For his exam, he found out that his grade was at the 25th percentile and the grit the scores were normally distributed with a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 10 what did he make so what <laughs> you guys crack me up so what did he make so we've got just a random written problem right here, and you can solve it from this. Now, here is your steps to acing any problem like this. The first thing you want to do is before even looking at the problem, well, we need a little bit of info, we need to put on here the uh, in context. Now, it might give us the context, and we might have to use a z-score, who knows, but I'm going to write below zero. What am I going to write below zero? Does anyone have any ideas what I'll write below zero? What am I going to write below zero? I've got the information at the top of the screen. What am I going to write below zero? 80, exactly. So we're going to write 80 right here. We're going to write 90, 100. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going up 10 each time. So each time I'm doing this, I'm going up and down 10 from the mean of 80. So we've drawn out our normal curve now with both the z-scores. The z-scores are the mean of 0 and standard deviations of 1. And then we also have below it our in context. This is going to help us when we solve the question. We also probably want to draw on here how much each area is. This right here is an area of how much. Now, we're probably going to have to zoom out to see. But how much area are, do we have on the curve up there at the top? How much area is up there on the curve? At the very top of the curve, how much area? <laughs> I would hope I get 110. 
I get, I get a question wrong every once in a while. How much area is up there at the top of the curve? Any ideas? 25%. You are right for 1,000 points right there. That is 25%. So we might do something like this where we draw an arrow and put 25% right here. And then we go down here and we go to 75%. So we actually have the 75th percentile or 25%. So we'll do percent because we did percent last time. It, that line or where this meets is the 75th percentile. So we do we could answer a question about what is the 75th percentile right now. We've got that information right here. Uh, why 25%? Great question. Uh, because right down here, it's telling us the probability and it's 25% on the curve. Thank you, 1,000 points for asking. But that means this area right up here is a total of 25% of the total area. So that, that is how much that area is worth. It tells you in the probability area, that is how much that area is total of the curve. And always kind of make sure it makes sense because look at it and be like, does that make sense? This will, things like this could very well be given to you on the test. We've done many questions like this. Like my hope is to cut this video. So if you're watching this in a later year, hello future. Um, but this is a common type of thing we do where we give you pictures and you have to then use it because we can't have you actually use an applet on a test. And Z tables are, we don't use those anymore. We use applets. There's so much, they, they find new exact answers and they're so quick. So with this right here, I'm gonna do another thing on this. I'm gonna go right here and I'm gonna plot a line right here. Now I want you to think about what I'm doing. I am now plotting the exact side of the curve but on the other side. So what I've done here is I'm shading the complete opposite side of the curve because I remembered something while solving this problem. If you go back and remember what the problem asks, it asks, um, and we'll always give it to you, it would be in the box, you are correct. Great question right there. We want to know the 25th percentile. So would you agree with me that this point down here is basically the same distance away? Like when you think about the distance this is away right here, it's gonna kind of be like symmetric distance away. So it's the same sort of like 25% on that side. So I want you to think right here, we know the z-score of the what percentile right now? We know the z-score of the what percentile? We know the z-score of the what percentile? What z-score we do, do, what z-score we do we know? And the 25th percentile would be the red portion. Great question, Jacob, right there. The 25th percentile means you're below 50%. That means uh, the bottom 25%. The 75th percentile is where we're at, and this has a z-score of 0.5 six, seven, four, five. So that is the Z score of that. Does that make sense? Now let's go here and let's find the Z score of this. Now it's equal distance. It's the same distance away. So what is the Z score of that one right there? What is the Z score of it? If it's the same distance away, can you tell me the Z score? What would the Z score of that be right there? Negative, just make it negative. It's the same distance away, just negative. Now, when we solve this problem, make sure your numbers down here make sense. If you're telling me it's a z-score of negative 6.745, it should make sense because you should see it on the plot. If you're drawing this out, make it make sense, do all your drawing, and be like, okay, it's going to be on the other side, and it's going to be same spot, just negative. Now, I want us to think about what a z-score means. A z-score tells us how many watts something is what to the what. How many watts something is what to the what. Every single z-score merely tells us, put it in the chat, practice, a z-score tells us just how many, let's see if we can write it right here, how many standard deviations away from the mean something is, yes, how many standard deviations above or below an observation is from the mean. So let me slow down and say that. A z-score tells us how many standard deviations an observation is above or below the mean. Negative z-scores mean something is below the mean, i.e. this area right here has a negative z-score. If something were to have a z-score of zero, it'd be right on the mean. And if something had a z-score that is positive, they scored above the mean. Nice answers in the chat, thousand points, those answers right there. It is how many standard deviations an observation is above or below the mean. So think about this. This person, Adam, right here, they are how many standard deviations below the mean? You can just, if it means that, Adam scored 6.6745 standard deviations below the mean. So let's go ahead and write that out. Well, we need the mean. So there's the mean. That's just the mean of the test, 80. And then we need to subtract because he's below the mean. So we're going to multiply the standard deviation of 10 by the z-score because that's how many standard deviations he is below the mean. Now, an important thing when we solve this right here is that our answer must be between what and what with our drawing. 
the answer for Adam needs to be, whatever we solve needs to be between what and what if this is all being logically done. Must be between, right there, a thousand points, and you are correct, needs to be between this. So we're gonna pull up our handy dandy calculator right here. Let's put this over on the side of the screen, go over here, and let's see here that we do 10 times 0 0.6745, and now we're gonna take 80 and subtract 80 from that, and there we go. That is the answer to the question. Nice job if you're solving this. Um, this is probably one of the more difficult type solve questions we could have on the test. Uh, that would be given to you, Zach. We'd have to give you that. Um, and I kind of knew that because it's the interquartile range number, but we would not expect you to get the Z-score to start. Uh, you'll start out uh, with a picture that looks just like, we're gonna go back, back, back. You would start this problem probably with a picture that looks just like this. That's all you get. So now you need to solve and put in, oh, it's coming back. <laughs> so you need to put in all that right there. I might've lost it all. Um, if we wanted to find the 75th percentile, the answer would be this. Um, technically, um, so the reason I subtracted is because the z-score was negative. So maybe we should, if we want to be really technical, we could write it in with this being a negative z-score. So um, that might be the more logical way. I just was like, okay, I need to go this many standard deviations below the mean, but you can just times the z-score if it's negative by the standard deviations and add it to the mean. So all this right here is the mean plus the standard deviation times the z-score, and that'll give you the observation y. So that'll, the mean, because it's how many standard deviations above or below the mean something is. So it's just doing the distance away from the mean. So we need to have the formula mean minus, uh, this formula right here, uh, this is not given to you on the test. Um, and you should also know the formula, observation minus mean over standard deviation is z-score. This is just a reworking of the formula to get you the y value. So this one is equal to y because it tells you the original value. It just, does that make sense? So those are two decent equations. One, to get a z-score, it's observation minus mean over standard deviation. To go back from a z-score, if you have the mean, a standard deviation, and the z-score, the reworking of it is you take the mean and add to it how many standard deviations times the z-score it is. So z-score tells you how many standard deviations it is away. Does that make more sense? So we know the shade area is 25 due to the area bottom being, yep, yep, uh, Christina, great answer right there. That's how you know that that's 25% right there. Uh, practice this chapter five. Um, oh no, okay. good question, Simon. Um, chapter five and chapter seven is like real talk with Brian right here. Chapter five and chapter seven are some of the hardest questions on the test. Um, I think a lot of people might make a good B or a, or a C on the test and they think, okay, wait a minute. I barely studied for this class. This class is easy. I made a B on the test. So they're like, okay, I, I got this. I made a B on the first test. I made an 82, I'm good. I'll see people make an 82 on the first test. Then on the next test, they'll go to a 50. And then on the final, they'll go to a 30. I've seen it. I've seen the reverse too, but it's, it's more likely people underestimate. The formula sheet is very, very small for this one. Now, and so don't let this be you. Um, the reason this happens is because a lot of the start of this class, when people get an 82, is because, and you might pass, do all the work, do all the homework, do all the quizzes, turn in the projects, you could still pass uh, with like, not, like a low C, because <laughs> your test average is like high, low 50s it looks like right now, your test average is low 50s, if you do all the homework, you do all the quizzes, you do all the projects, you could still make like a low C. I mean, you don't want to do that, you, you, bear, you, you made a B, a, low, a high F, low F, um, yeah, I think you would you make a high D or a low C if you did everything else. And I don't mean like kind of doing the other work. I mean, do all the homework, do all the quizzes, do all the projects, turn the projects in early, and you might be able to pull off a C. Um, but you don't want to be in this scenario. The reason is, is people towards the end kind of like, this is getting tough. This is getting difficult. We will work every problem we can. And you guys know we have the Wednesday extra help. I will be here. I will work problems. Ask, do I answer emails? Do I answer your questions when you email me? When we have the grades project back, they have 10 days to grade them. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping soon. <laughs> I will answer your emails. I will reply to you. Make sure to email the right B Stevens. I will reply to your emails. I will help you during office hours. Always answer those emails. 
I try to do it as quick as possible. If you email me during the day, that's when I don't answer because I'm doing this stuff. Um, I do answer them and make sure to use, let's remind everybody, <laughs> use stat 201 dash your initials, mine are Brian, Joseph Stevens. Don't use my initials and then topic here. So use, uh, do this format. It helps me a lot. I know you guys might see that all at the end, but um, we'll answer the lurking topics right there. Statue one. And then your initials, Zach, your initials right there. Make sure your initials. Um, and it really helps me because a lot of days I might have 50 to 100 emails and it's really easy to see what you're asking, what class you're in. And it probably saves me, I'd say five to 10 seconds in email. If you do that by 50 emails, 10 seconds in email, that's 500 minutes. So you're looking, I mean, 500 seconds. I can do math maybe. Um, but it saves me time. And I found it's really just a good, like, I can see what class you're in. I can see what the question's about. Um, and then also in the email, someone doesn't have to like say I'm in this class or I'm doing this. I just know instantaneously what class you're in. I know what your question's about. And then I can reply very quickly to emails. And I like that. It helps me and it helps you guys. Um, do we need to know anything about lurking variables? Yes. Lurking variables are things like if we have here summer, I already ruined the example. If we have here shark attacks, remember the lurking variable, shark attacks and ice cream sales. When you talk about shark attacks and ice cream sales, it's a classic example right here. We're going to do shark attacks in red right here for blood. And shark attacks are all of a sudden getting high right there, and then we've got some nice cold ice cream. Now, a nice cold ice cream with the space pen is going to kind of follow this. And what do you notice? It's like when shark attacks go up, ice cream sales go up. So what does this mean? Is it shark attacks are causing ice cream sales? Like people are like, oh man, sharks are out. Let's go eat some ice cream. Or is it like ice cream sales are causing shark attacks? So, oh no, okay, like sharks caused the Titanic. No, um, <laughs> ice cream attracts sharks. Did you know there was a law about putting ice cream in your back pocket? Because people would use it to like walk horses away. They'd put an ice cream cone in their back pocket. So summer, so more ice cream sales. You're right. It's true that summer is the lurking variable behind all of this. So summer is the reason. So that is what a lurking variable is. A lurking variable is a third variable, Sam, thousand points, that is actually the, the one that's doing all this. So we don't, shark attacks and ice cream sales, are tr they're related. They're associated. That doesn't mean they cause each other. We can never say they cause unless we do some sort of scientific experiment. We don't really talk about it too much in this class because this is more about kind of what you would see unless you were doing experiments, which kind of control for variation. But um, shark attacks and ice cream sales are associated. They're definitely not causal. It seems to be the causal thing is uh, all residuals. I'll probably talk about it more in the review because I need to right now just run to my office and so if you guys wait for me just a moment, don't leave yet. I'm just going to run to my office here and I'll be right back. So hang out for just a moment here. Don't leave. I'll be right back. Be right back. Brian, what's up? Hey, Adam. Oh, what's this? Adam, what are you doing? Adam. No! I, guys, I, uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I, Brian's gone. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Just Go to Kahoot, we'll get this figured out. Uh, he sent you the information, it's on Canvas, it's on YouTube, just go to Kahoot. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna figure this out, it's gonna happen. Uh, that's all I got, just go to Kahoot. Thanks. Ugh.